वेलकम टू शंकर्स डेली एडिटोरियल एनालिसिस शंकर ए एस अकेडमी इज गोइंग टू कंडक्ट अ प्रिलिम टेस्ट सीरीज नोन एस दी प्री स्ट्रॉमिंग दिस टेस्ट सीरीज कंसिस्ट ऑफ ऑलमोस्ट फोर्टी एट टेस्ट यू कैन एनरोल इन दिस टेस्ट सीरीज बाई क्लिकिंग इन दी लिंक गिवन बिलो इन दी डिस्क्रिप्शन Today's topic of discussion is these three editorials, which are taken from the Hindu and the Indian Express newspaper. In the first editorial, we will discuss about the UBI, which is the Universal Basic Income, and what are the challenges in implementation, and what are the advantages of this UBI policy. And in the second editorial, we will discuss about the Section 6A of the Citizenship Act 1955, and what is the basis of it, which is the Assam Accord of 1985. And lastly, we will see about the SDG trends of India and what are the development issues in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Without further delay, let's get into today's discussion. Have a look at this editorial taken from Indian Express newspaper. This editorial mainly discusses about the recent judgment by the Supreme Court regarding the Section 6A of the Citizenship Act 1955. So, what is this Section 6A of the Citizenship Act? This Act was mainly implemented to to implement the provisions in the Assam Accord. This mainly deals with the issues that is the citizenship issues with respect to the. state of assam so the court has upheld the upheld the section 6a of the citizenship act it has also deeply examined the meaning of citizenship and article 29 of the indian constitution along with it it also displayed a interconnection between the right to vote and the citizenship talking about the detailed explanation of the citizenship it has taken a liberal as well as a broad based view of the citizenship this emphasizes the inclusivity rather than a domestic definition of a citizenship so it has also talked about the article 29 in this judgment so the article 29 mainly deals with the conserving the culture of any group of citizens so this judgment says that it does not include only the conservation of culture of any group but does not prevent the existence of other culture as well it gave a multicultural pluralistic interpretation of the article 29 so as already said this section 6a was implemented to apply the provisions which are given in the assam accord of 1985 so to understand the basis of this judgment we have to go to the root which is the assam accord so now in this discussion we will see what is assam accord what is the background of this accord we will also see what is the key provisions in this assam accord and conclude with the challenges let's start with the main question discuss the significance of assam accord of 1985 in addressing the issue of the illegal migration in assam so this is the first part of the question we have to discuss the significance which is the key word here and second we have how has its implementation shaped the socio political landscape of this region this is the second part which we have to address let's start with the basic what is assam accord of 1985 so this is an agreement which was signed between the government of india the rajiv gandhi period government and the state of assam along with the leaders of the student union who are aasu and aagsp so these are the student union so the main aim of this accord is to resolve the illegal migration issue in the assam so the illegal migrants from the bangladesh were migrating to the state of assam to resolve this issue this accord was signed between the government of india and the leaders of the student union in the assam actually they held almost a 6 year assam movement which led to the signing of this accord here you can see the map assam is sharing the border with bangladesh in this part as well as here so the migrants are reaching the assam through this path so to understand the assam accord let's start with the background first as already said this assam accord was signed to resolve the issue of illegal migration from the early 20th century assam experienced waves of migration starting from the british rule and later after the independence particularly from the bangladesh so this led to demographic changes in the assam and raised fears among the indigenous people because they were outnumbered and they also feared their culture may be threatened so this led to the assam movement among the assam people so this movement actually began in the year of 1979 the main aim of this movement is to 
identify and deport the illegal immigrants from the Assam. So, first we have a cutoff period to identify who are illegal migrants. You will see that in the subsequent uh, slides, but uh, try to understand that the main aim of them is to deport the illegal immigrants. So, this movement gained momentum over the time and led to many violent clashes in the Assam. So, now I will say about the cutoff date. So, the cutoff date which is mentioned in this accord is the March 25, 1971 when Bangladesh was formed. So, before this March 25, 1971, we have a period called as the pre-1966 migrants. So, the people who entered the Assam before this January 1, 1966, they were regularized as the Indian citizens. But during the period of 1966 to 71, these migrants were to be detected and they have to be de disenfranchised for about 10 years and later they were given the Indian citizenship. This is with respect to the 1966 to 71 period. But after the 1971, which is the March 25, 1971, the migrants from the Bangladesh to the Assam were detected expelled and deported based on the Foreigners Act. This is the cutoff period I mentioned earlier. So, talking about the other provisions, the government agreed to detect and deport the illegal migrants who entered the Assam after this cutoff period. This is the point they are mentioning here. This accord also aims to safeguard the cultural as well as the linguistic identity of the people of Assam. Special provisions were made to protect preserve as well as promote the cultural, social and the linguistic heritage of the people of Assam. The government also made promise to accelerate the economic development in Assam. So, this can be done by establishing new industrial projects, by improving the infrastructure and increasing the employability in Assam. It also included the measures to secure the international border, especially with the Bangladesh so, they ensure that this will be done by constructing the fences and enhancing the vigilance to prevent the further illegal migration. So, based on this accord, a tribunal system will be established to speed up the process of identifying and deporting the illegal migrants. And this tribunal system later led to the establishment of the foreigners tribunals. These are the key provisions which we have to understand about the Assam Accord based on which the section 6a of the Citizenship Act was formed. So, now we will see what are the outcomes and challenges because of this Assam Accord. First is the delayed implementation. Many provisions in this accord are facing the implementation challenges and delays. So, this leads to the discontinuous discontent among the people of Assam. Next is the NRC which is the National Register of Citizens. To implement this Assam Accord, the National Register of Citizens in Assam was updated from time to time. First update took place in 1951 and later the update was done in the 2015. But however, the controversies arose because nearly 1.9 million people were excluded from the registry. This is the next challenge with respect to the Assam Accord. Thirdly, we have the cultural protection. Several efforts were taken to preserve the linguistic and cultural identity of the people of, of Assam. But however, ethnic tensions still remain high in these regions. And lastly, we have the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019. Based on this amendment act, this renewed protest in the Assam because this amendment led to the provision where there is a pathway for the citizenship for the non-Muslim immigrants from the neighboring countries such as Bangladesh. So, many critics argues that this is violating the Assam Accord spirit by allowing the other immigrants into the India after the cutoff date which is the March 25, 1971. So, now we will see what are the significance of this Assam Accord. First is the Peace and stability. The Assam Accord brought into the Assam movement, which started in the 1979, by providing a negotiated settlement between both the parties. And next, it led to the formation of a legal framework for identification of the illegal migrants. So, this will ensure the cultural security and linguistic security for the local Assam people. And thirdly, we have the political impact. 
this Assam Accord became a major political issue in Assam by influencing the electoral outcome as well. So, on the whole, the Assam Accord of 1985 remains a significant milestone in the Assam's history because it addressed the long-standing concern which is the illegal migration from the Bangladesh as well as to safeguard the cultural identity of the indigenous people of Assam. But because of the partial implementation of this accord, it is affecting the region's politics as well as the social security of this region. So, in this editorial discussion, we detail is about the Assam accord and all the dimensions of it. With this, we will conclude discussion on this editorial and now let us move on to the next one. Take a look at this editorial which is regarding the UBI which is the Universal Basal Income. So, this editorial mainly discusses a modified approach to implement the Universal Basic Income. So, it, this editorial highlights the challenges such as funding, economic sustainability and the need for the targeted assistance. So, it also emphasizes that rather than a universal cash transfer, this editorial is suggesting a UBI that will integrate with the existing social welfare programs, particularly focusing on the vulnerable groups. So, on this context, let us try to understand about the UBI, what are the advantages and what are the features of it. We will also discuss the challenges in this UBI. Let us start with the main question. What is universal basic income? What are the advantages and challenges in the implementation? So, let us start with the basic information about the UBI. This is nothing but it is a economic policy where the government will give the regular as well as a unconditional cash to the citizens. They will give the cash regardless of their income, employment status or any other factors. The main idea behind this UBI is to ensure that everyone in the country has a basic level of financial security to cover the essential needs such as food, shelter and the health. So, this is the UBI where the government will give the cash to the citizens to meet the basic expenses. So, now we will see what are the features of this UBI. First is the universality. So, the universal basic income is provided to all the individuals of the country regardless of their income level, employment status and the other factors such as age, gender and the social status. You may wonder why the cash is provided to the wealthy section of the society. Here, they are paying a large amount of tax. For paying the tax, they have to get a written social security from the government. That is why they are providing this universal basic income to the higher section of the society as well. So, next is the unconditionality. There is no basic requirement which has to be met by the people such as a seeking employment or there is a need for them to participate in this program. That is, there is no specific requirement for the recipients. This is the unconditionality in the universal basic income. Next is the regularity. This payment has to be made at the regular intervals such as monthly or annually. So, this will provide a stable as well as a predictable source of income to the recipients. And this regularity in the payment will help the individuals to plan their expenses and manage the financial needs of them. Next is the cash based payment. Usually, this universal basic income is provided in the form of cash rather than in other forms such as food or other vouchers. So, the cash will offer them a flexibility to spend their money based on their requirement. This is the cash based requirement, cash based provision of the universal basic income. And lastly, we have the individuality. Usually, this income is provided to the individual rather than the household or families. Each person receive their payment independent of the household composition. So, this feature that is paying them on the individual basis will ensure that all the members in the society have access to the share of benefit. So, this is thereby promoting the personal autonomy of the individual citizen. These are the main features of the universal basic income. Now, we will see what are the challenges of this UBI. First is the cost and funding. So, for conducting the UBI, we require a substantial funding. So, this may lead to increasing the taxes or by reallocating the existing budgets. So, and this can lead to political challenges in the country. 
Next is the inflationary risks. Because of the income to all the citizens of India, this can increase the demand of the product in the market, which can substantially lead to the inflation in the market. Next, we have the disincentives to the work. Many critics argue that if you are giving a guaranteed income, this may reduce the work motivation among the people. Although some studies show that this is a overstated concern, but generally there is a concern regarding the, there is a reduction in the motivation for work. Next is the targeting versus universality. By providing the universal basic income universally, it can be seen as an inefficient method because the targeted programs are usually seen as efficient as it is introduced by the bureaucracy. Next, we have to talk about the impact on the welfare. This UBI can disrupt the support system such as disability benefits, such as the amount which is given to the physically challenged people. Next is the political resistance. There is a skepticism about the UBI as it is given to all the people rather than the target individual. This can complicate the adoption of the policy. And lastly, we have the regional disparities. Because of the varying cost of living, Giving the same amount of universal basic income can be challenging to the people across different regions. And lastly, we have the scalability issue. By transitioning from the pilot programs to the implementation at the national level, this can pose challenges in capturing the broader dynamics of the economy. These are the challenges with respect to the implementation of the UBI in India. Now, we will see what are the advantages of this UBI. First is the reduction of poverty. So, you can understand here that UBI is providing a guaranteed income. This will ensure that everyone has a minimum level of income to cover all their basic needs. So, this will thereby reduce the poverty in the country. Next is the simplicity in the efficiency. This UBI is going to simplify the social welfare system because it is providing a single as well as a universal payment to all the people without meeting a eligibility criteria. So, without having a correct eligible criteria, this will eventually reduce the administrative cost and bureaucracy which is associated with this traditional welfare programs. It is also going to reduce the risk of excluding eligible individuals. So, this is the main advantage with respect to UBI which is there is a simplicity and efficiency in the implementation. Next is the economic security and stability. The UBI will provide a stable source of income that will help the individuals to withstand any shock in the economy such as joblessness, illness or any sudden changes in the economy such as the COVID. It also creates an empowerment among the society. By giving the UBI, the recipients have a freedom to decide how to use their money. This flexibility of having a cash to decide what they want is allowing the individual to prioritize their own needs, whether they have to spend on the education, healthcare, or maybe investing in a small business. And lastly, we have the reduction in the inequality. As already mentioned, UBI is given to everyone equally. This will reduce the income inequality by providing lower income individual with larger percentage and increase in their total income as a whole. So, this redistribution effect can help in the narrowing of the income gap between the wealthy and the poor. So, in this news article discussion, we discussed about the basic features of the UBI, what are the challenges and advantages. At the start of the discussion, we were given with the main question, you can write the answers for the question and post it in the comment section. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this editorial and now let us move on to the next one. So, take a look at this editorial which is taken from the Hindu newspaper. This editorial mainly focuses on the STG which is the Sustainable Development Goal and what are the development issues that is the human development issues which are faced by the India, especially the gender inequality and the inequality in the income. So, let us begin with the question first. Define the concept of carrying capacity of the ecosystem as relevant to the environment. Explain how understanding this concept is vital for planning the sustainable development of a region. So, this question was asked in the year 2019. Uh, now, we will see what is HDR first, which is the Human Development Report. So, this report is published by the UNDP, which is the United Nations Development Program. So, this 
report is published since the year 1990 and they focus on various themes within the human development approach such as health education and the standard of living this human development report consists of the human development index which consists of three indicators namely the health education and the standard of living this index is used to measure the progress of the human development so now let's have a basic understanding about this index because it is important from the prelims perspective so this hta consists of three indicators as already said first is the health in health they will measure the life expectancy which is the average number of years a newborn is expected to live so this life expectancy will reflect the health and the quality of life in the particular country and second we have the education which is consist of both mean years of schooling and the expected years of schooling in mean years of schooling it is nothing but the average number of years of education received by the people who are aged 25 or above so this is aligning with the sdg goal of 4.3 so we know sdg 4 comes under the quality education under this we have the sdg 4.3 which is nothing but it is focusing on access to a affordable and a quality education this is the second indicator which consist of the human development index under the education we also have the mean years of schooling and the expected years of schooling and this mean years of schooling is aligning with the 4.4 which is we have to enhance the skill for creating employment decent jobs and to gain income through the entrepreneurship and lastly we have the gni which is the gross national income so the standard of living is measured with the gross national income which is adjusted for the ppp which is the purchasing power parity and this will reflect the standard of living because by calculating the income level it will reflect the standard of living in this country we can see here that it is aligning with the 8.5 which is the SDG goal 8 consists of decent work conditions and 8.5 is focusing on full employment and the decent work for all the citizens these are the three indicators which are considered by the HTI index and it consists of various values such as the development is considered by calculating the geometrical mean of all three dimensions which is the health education and standard of living and based on that we will have a value for example if you are going to have 0.800 and above it is said as high but india comes under the medium category we have four very high high medium and low and india comes under medium which is 0.550 to the 0.699 so understanding the basics about the hti now we will see what is the progress of india in hti so india has seen a significant improvement in the hti because in 1990 we had a hti of value 0.434 and in 2022 it was 0.644 so there was a increase of 48.4 percentage in the hti value which is a significant improvement and in 2022 we ranked 134th rank of out of the 193 countries as already said we belong to the medium human development category which is 0.644 so 0.550 to 0.699 belong to the category of medium and we belong to the medium category and recently there is a slow growth in the hta because it is significantly influenced by the covid impacts by comparing with the other countries with respect to hta india ranks lower because we have a low hta value compared to the other asian countries such as malaysia thailand china sri lanka and other countries we have improved only by four ranks with respect to the 2015 to 2022 so these are the trends which you have to remember with respect to the progress of india in the hti so now we will understand what is sustainable development goals so sustainable development is nothing but a development which will meet the needs of present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs this is called as the sustainable development so at 1983 the united nations created a world commission on environment and development and this commission was later known as the brentland commission and this commission defined this meaning of sustainable development 
and in 1992 earth summit which ha occurred in the rio de janeiro brazil a global action plan was formulated the main aim of this plan is to conduct the sustainable development which will enhance the human lives as well as protect the environment this was the main aim of the plan which was formulated in the rio summit and in 2000 a millennium declaration happened in the un quarters and in this declaration they adopted eight development goals and 18 targets which has to be accomplished within the year 2015 and in 2015 a un sustainable development summit occurred and in this summit they adopted a agenda for the sustainable development and this agenda includes almost 17 sustainable goals and 169 targets which has to be achieved by the year 2030. So, take a look at all these 17 sustainable development goals. All these goals are very important. You can quote these goals in the intro or conclusion of your answer rating. So, this editorial also has mentioned about the gender development and disparities. There is a disparity in the human development by gender. By calculating the HDA for women and men separately and taking the ratio we can identify the gender disparity if it is closer to one there is, it indicates that there is a lesser gap between the men and women in the human development so these are some important data which were mentioned in this editorial you can make note of this so in 2017 to 18 the percentage of women working age is only about 23.3 percentage but it has increased to almost 37 percentage in the year 2022 to 23 and the periodic labor force survey is published by the ministry of statistics and program implementation and they gave the data of female labor force participation rate it has increased from 24.6 percentage to 41.5 percentage in the rural level and the percentage of women that is the female labor force participation rate in urban areas has witnessed only a marginal increase that is from 20.4 percentage to 25.4 percentage but here there is a significant increase compared to the urban areas you should also note that female labor force participation rate in india is much lower than the other neighboring countries in India, which is a major concern. Talking about the income inequality in India, India has a high income inequality because the top 1 percentage holds almost 21.7 percentage of the national income, which is a huge inequality among the have and the have nots. By comparing with the other countries, India has a higher inequality in income compared to the global average as well as other countries such as Bangladesh and the China. So, we have to address the gender disparities and the rising income inequalities to achieve the sustainable development goals which were fixed in the year 2015 which has to be achieved within the 2030. So, various policy recommendations has been made. For example, we have to focus on the redu reduction of gender gaps in the labor force participation rate. We can also tackle the income inequality by promoting the equitable economic growth. By implementing the targeted measures to support the vulnerable populations in the India, we can achieve human development and a progress in the sustainable development. So, in this editorial discussion, we saw what is HDI, what are the indicators in the HDI. We also saw what is the trend of HDI in India. We compared it with other countries as well. Then we saw what is the gender inequality in India and the income inequality between the rich and the poor. We also mentioned about the female labor force participation rate. So, mostly this editorial we discussed some important trends and data which you can mention in the answer rating. So, kindly make note of it. We will conclude the discussion on this article. We have come to end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedback, says comment and do not forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.